Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bible study this morning at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, this series is called What Do Lutherans Believe? It's an introduction to Lutheran faith and life. And um, we will be talking today about natural knowledge of God, paganism, and the theology of glory. Uh, and let's pray and we'll get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you that uh, you have revealed yourself to us in your holy word, for we would only have natural knowledge to run on, and that knowledge even perceived and processed uh, as through a veil or through a glass darkly. Bless and be with us today as we study. Fill us with your love. Teach us in wisdom and understanding that we may share Christ with others. We ask in his holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, very good. We're going to get started today. We've been talking about uh, the natural knowledge of God, and we're moving toward the revealed uh, knowledge of God as the Bible uh, does that. So let's talk a little bit more about the evaluation of natural knowledge, looking around at nature as a way to know that there um, is a God. While some knowledge can be found, and we, we talked about Romans chapter 1 last week, that all creation bears witness to God's invisible qualities, um, it cannot tell us things like God is a personal God, God loves you, God is for you, God wants to save you, etc. Uh, it doesn't tell you these things, it mainly tells you things about his might and about his power, uh, about his glory, it tells you things that are uh, primarily according to the law. Uh, as well. Um, it, the book here says, and I am looking now at the blue book, Call to Believe, Teach, and Confess, um, that text on page uh, 31. By means of natural knowledge, humans might conclude that there is a, a personal, eternal, omnipotent divine being who has created the universe and still preserves and rules all things. I would, of course, disagree with whether or not personal is a part of that. There's nothing about nature that says God is personal. Um, it might be concluded that this God is holy and just, demanding what is good and punishing what is evil. Yes. Uh, but because of our sinfulness and rebellion before this God, this knowledge does not and cannot produce a loving relationship with him. And that's the point of it not being personal, that knowledge. Um, in fact, it has quite the opposite effect, result resulting in further alienation. Romans 1 talks about this. Um, the, the fact that God from nature is mainly viewed as an all-powerful, uh, possibly tyrannical, possibly capricious uh, God, that uh, what, what man is driven in his sinful brokenness to believe um, is uh, that things should be worshipped and appeased, sun, moon, and stars, uh, trees, uh, rivers, uh, or carved idols, that kind of thing. Um, this doesn't produce a loving relationship with God, but rather a misunderstanding of God and a desire to appease him so he won't wallop us. That's, that's the idea there. Um, this, by the way, continues, for example, in animism today. We see this primarily in African tribal religions where they will appease. They, they see, you know, gods, little g, gods and everything, um, they perceive little g gods and everything, and they will sacrifice their last chicken or their last rice or whatever it is that they have to eat will sacrifice the last of it, toss it in the river or, you know, kill it and put the carcass at the base of a tree or something to appease the local uh, little g god or gods <clears throat> so that they will not do harm to them. We see this also in uh, Shinto and other forms of uh, ancestor worship, uh, for example, in Asia, but in other places as well that do ancestor worship, uh, where you have a little shrine and you leave food and other things for uh, departed ancestors. So again, so that they're, uh, uh, you know, um, um, spirits won't come back and um, deviously harm you and play tricks on you and do things to you. Um, voodoo is a version of animism that involves appeasement, where uh, the point of voodoo is for you to become possessed by the loa or spirits, uh, in other words, demons, and uh, they will give you wisdom and knowledge that will hopefully help you get one up on your neighbor, particularly your enemies, 
and again, hopefully they will be appeased and not hurt you. Uh, you get, get the idea that this goes on and on and on. This is a theology of glory, and this is where we're going today into, into understanding that even a theology of glory directed toward God um, is pagan uh, in its roots because it's really only seeking to appease an all-powerful God, please don't hurt me, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, let's continue in the text. Uh, in fact, it has quite the opposite effect resulting in further alienation. So you, you, when you are concerned that if you don't appease God, he'll crush you, that's not a personal relationship. Um, there's nothing salvific about that. You're just trying to minimize the damage. Okay, That's a theology of glory. I want to minimize the damage. Okay? Since it reveals that we've broken God's law, the scriptures say that it results in nothing more than a guilty conscience, and that's the point. A theology of glory is incredibly dangerous, and again, I uh, want to emphasize, because we're, we're going to go to this in a second, this a theology of glory, when you were limited to a theology of glory about God, um, we can have nothing but a guilty conscience. Uh, we are just simply trying to, to minimize uh, the damage. Yesterday, Cheryl and I watched um, a movie from the LCMS that I highly recommend, and that uh, probably I will bring into Bible study at some point. The first, Rosa. Uh, Dr. Rosa Young uh, was an LCMS educator. Uh, she is the mother of Lutheranism in the Deep South, particularly Alabama. Um, her work with uh, LCMS uh, missions uh, to uh, Black Americans led to the founding of 35 uh, parishes in Alabama and 30 schools, including Concordia, Selma, Alabama. Um, and it was a phenomenal movie. One of the interesting things that I, I picked up on, it was said quickly, her father was a, a, an African Methodist pastor, but uh, typically those guys were untrained. And they uh, preached and they taught um, that, that God needed to be appeased. It was very much a theology of glory. And uh, she, there was a quote in that movie, something about whether it was her father or another preacher saying um, something about um, loving God, but not being, oh, it was a hymn. It was a hymn that was being sung at that time, early 1900s, uh, love, about loving God, but not being certain if we're saved and kind of hoping we're forgiving, but not knowing. And um, that's what um, triggered in her mind that what, you know, this question about could this really be what God is about? And uh, then there's a whole story about how she became involved with the LCMS because she wasn't originally Lutheran. Um, I commend that movie to you. You can go to Vimeo, that, ser that online service of Vimeo. It's a YouTube alternative Vimeo. Um, the LCMS has its own channel there. And the first Rosa is that documentary is there. It's very well done. Very good stuff. It's something that our school kids need to see and that I uh, commend to you as well for your families at home. All right, so the, the point here is that we can have nothing more than a guilty conscience, and that was what that hymn was about. Um, loving God, but not knowing if you're really forgiven and really saved. Romans 1 talks about that. So does Romans 2. Uh, you can only have also a fear of death. Hebrews 2 talks about this. This is what you're, you're stuck with if you don't know God personally as your Savior and Redeemer. Um, you can only uh, anticipate condemnation. Galatians 3 talks about this. Um, you can only have um, hopelessness. And Ephesians 2 talks about this. We were born dead in our sins and transgressions. And we'd, you know, we were following the spirit of the, uh, the power of the air and, and so forth and have nothing to expect but hopelessness and condemnation. Uh, the book says natural knowledge is the basis for many religions that believe the gods of nature must be appeased. I was talking about that earlier. But natural knowledge, this is very interesting, does not know if this can be done and therefore cannot say how this can be done. This is how you get um, so many world religions. And in fact, all of them but Christianity are law-based, right? Because there's only two religions, a law of grace or a, um, a law of works and everything else but Christianity is works. And, and so you have um, all of this, uh, th these attempts to appease you know, this, this God concept, little g, God concept to keep from getting walloped. Uh, the text continues now with the theology of glory. 
Unfortunately, the conclusions of natural knowledge are sometimes combined with Christianity. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Um, the notion that God can be known in his power and majesty and appeased, even manipulated to respond favorably. That, by the way, uh, is, the, the, uh, w- is what underlies the prosperity gospel. If you pray enough, if you believe enough, if you visualize enough, God will give you what you want. That's manipulating God, instrumentalizing God for personal gain, all right? To um, respond favorably to our earthly struggles and sufferings through human religious activity, That is what is a theology of glory. So let me read that again. The notion that God can be known in his power and majesty and appeased, even manipulated, to respond favorably to our earthly struggles and sufferings through human religious activity, that is called a theology of glory. It seeks God on human terms. Can't overemphasize this, all right? This is seeking God on human terms. Now, inherent in this teaching is the notion that human actions such as rituals, prayers, works, sacrifices, and so forth can appease God's wrath, and that human beings have the ability to solve the great problems in nature and society if they can just get God to kick in a little power. God is reduced to act in ways that make sense to us. So we've got a boxed-in, limited God concept, okay? Questions such as, why is there suffering in the world? Or, why do believers have to suffer? place demands on God from a human point of view alone. The answers are sought in human reason and not God's word. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong to ask those questions. Okay? It's normal. It's okay to ask those questions. But the point is to draw our attention to the fact that we are seeking for things to make sense that aren't necessarily guaranteed to make sense, right? God's word tells us there will be suffering in this world. It's broken. It's sinful. These things are going to happen, okay? God's word also tells us that Christian existence, the life of a believer, is the life at the foot of the cross. If we want to know what is Christian life, look at the cross. That's what it's going to be. And, and this, this notion that everything should be pie in the sky. You know, I'm a believer now. Click. Everything should work perfectly. Um, really is rationalization, human rationalization. That's not God's word. That's us wanting to superimpose upon the Bible and God our way of thinking. Um, Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it our way, right? Yeah, that's what we're going for. The old Burger, Burger King, maybe? Burger King commercial? Yeah. All right, very good. And totally dating myself. Young ones, look that up online. Yeah. All right. When this is done, uh, one stumbles on the concept of Jesus, the suffering Savior. Yes. Okay, and and I'm going to come back to this in a big way in just a minute. Christ crucified is foolishness and a stumbling block to many. 1 Corinthians 1. Okay, why? Well, here's why. If you have this human, limited, and limiting view of God that's only about power, glory, majesty, and things going right, you cannot look at the cross and see God in that. Something's dramatically wrong, you'll think, with the cross, when in reality, what's dramatically wrong is our God concept. The framework you know, through which we approach God, that's what's busted. That's what's wrong, not Christ on the cross, okay? 
instead of this biblical savior, Christ is often depicted by a theology of glory only as a healer, a miracle worker, or as someone who gives blessings in this life. I want to add to that sentence a therapist. Okay? Um, our culture, particularly American Christian culture, pop culture, wants to recast Jesus as my therapist. He holds my hand. He gets me through my rough times. He makes me feel better when I'm sad. Um, a, 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 a parallel to this is uh, the Jesus is my boyfriend theology. Um, and, you'll, and you'll hear this in some um, pop Christian songs that are basically um, rehashed prom songs to Jesus. You're so beautiful. You're so lovely. Um, and I don't want to characterize all of pop Christian music like that. I do want to point out, though, that, that some of it is problematic, though not all of it. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. This Jesus, uh, someone who's the healer, the miracle worker, or the answer to life here, gives us what we want on our terms, the book says, at our command. Such conclusions fail to grasp the true majesty of God and the reality of our sinful blindness and spiritual deadness before him. Wow. Do that again. Okay, so there's a meme, by the way. It was popular. It's been years ago, a few years ago. Buddy Jesus. You can look that up and see that meme. Buddy Jesus. Uh, he's kind of a hipster uh, friend, Jesus. Okay, so the theology of glory, Jesus, gives us what we want on our terms at our request, our command. Such conclusions fail to grasp the true majesty of God and the reality of our sinful blindness and our spiritual deadness before him. When we are overly reliant on natural knowledge, we often see only what we want to see. That is a huge, huge, big deal. Now we're going to go to the screen share because I want to talk about this, but I want to do it carefully. Um, when I was at the seminary, I was taught um, by some, not all in the practical department, that um, our liturgy, our historic liturgy is a little outmoded and a little outdated, that maybe it it wasn't the best idea to wear vestments anymore and do liturgy and have traditional church that, that maybe American culture had progressed to the point where these old things, traditional things weren't really relevant um, anymore. And, and that's a thing that's, that's according to the flesh, easy to buy into. And, and plenty of us did. This has been a running issue, right, at the St. Louis Seminary for probably 20 years and maybe a few more than that. I was there 2000 to 2004, and it certainly was a component then. Um, I don't know now. I'm not there now. But at any rate, I'm ta so I'm talking about 20 years ago, and I want to give the impression that this is still there. I don't know. Um, the point is, is that, so I came out of that setting thinking, well, that must be the most effective way to do church now. And so in my first two calls, um, we had both a traditional service, boy, I can't stand these labels, but traditional service and a quote unquote contemporary service, which wasn't contemporary because the contemporary Christian movement comes out of the 1980s and is already 40 years old. Anyway, so, but we, we you know, we kind of did that. So we kept major components of the liturgy, but had a band and so forth. And um, the, the, the things that you're supposed to do because they're more relevant. Um, and then discover, and, and believe me, at my second parish, the, the group of musicians we had were 
easily as good as what was on the radio, easily. Uh, they were being asked by people to come play at National Youth Gathering. They were phenomenal. Um, and they could take something they had heard on the radio that just came out, and by the following Sunday, they could play that. And they could do it as good or better than who was doing it on the radio. They were phenomenal. Anyway, um, what I discovered through that is, is some very important lessons like Taking out the liturgy, which is catechetical, dumbs down church. And when you dumb down church, you dumb down Christians. That was a problem. Um, the style of music is particular to a certain group of people, but not everyone. And so only those people like it, and everybody else is kind of separated and put off. Nobody knows the words. So you go from congregational singing to everybody kind of trying to get the words and not, you know. Um, it just was problem after problem after problem. It also would pull people into church for the sake of the music until they grew tired of it or they discovered we were really actually about the gospel or that some other place did the music better and then they just simply went there. They didn't care. They weren't there for the theology. So there's tons and tons of problems with this. Not all of it's bad. So I don't, I don't want to say that. But what I want to point out is, is, is that there, there are some issues. And one of the main ones is, is that these songs primarily, not all, primarily, not all, are about a theology of glory. That's not our theology. Let's take a look. I want to show you, I went, I just, all I did this morning was pulled at the time I was doing this, um, three or four songs that were on the playlist of, of K-Love, and I'm going to try to share screen. So we're going to share screen so you can see what I'm seeing. Start broadcast. Three, two, one. Okay, hopefully sharing screen. It says I am. And we're going to go. You should be able to see my screen. Look no further by Evie McKinney. And um, I just grabbed whatever the last four songs, four or five, whatever they played. Uh, look at the lyrics. For the ones who feel like they're defeated, too weak to stand back up and fight, for the ones still running, he is waiting like a father with arms open wide. Um, won't you lift, up, uh, lift your eyes from the ground? Heaven is calling out. Come and see where true love is found. If you're looking for freedom, looking for a breakthrough, looking for somebody who knows every pain that you hold and the things you're going through, if you've got a heart that's broken into pieces, if you need a healer, a savior, a miracle maker, then you don't have to look no further than Jesus. Woo, look, that's what it says. Look no further than Jesus. Look no further than Jesus. Uh, look no further than Jesus. For the ones who feel they've been rejected, uh, for the ones who hang their heads in shame, um, won't you lift your eyes from your doubt? Um, the cross is calling now. Big point, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. This actually mentions the cross, and a lot of them don't. But with power that can turn your life around. Okay, so there's the focus. Uh, and then this goes on with the same kind of repeated lyrics. So here, here's, here's my point. You get plus one because the cross is actually mentioned a lot of these songs don't even mention the cross. Um, I think I saw Jesus mentioned, yes, another plus, because a lot of these don't even mention Jesus. They just sort of expect you to know. But look at the theology and what's going on here. For the ones who feel like they're defeated, too weak to stand back up and fight, right? Um, here's, another, here's another line. If you're looking for freedom, looking for a breakthrough, looking for somebody who knows every pain that you hold, notice that all of these things are focused on this life. That's exactly what the book um, was, was talking about. Um, here's, here's what it said. This theology, theology of glory, seeks God on human terms. Okay, um, So Christ is often depicted only as a healer, a miracle worker, or someone who gives blessings for this life. Um, and what I'm pointing out, trying to adjust the sound, I can hear myself echoing back. All I'm pointing out is that 
this is the issue with a lot of this music. It's a theology of glory based in things getting better in, in this life. You don't hear a lot about blood atonement. That song gets kudos uh, for mentioning the cross and mentioning Jesus. Unfortunately, it redirected from the cross to power in this life. Here's Jeremy Camp, Keep Me in the Moment. This should be on your screen. I've been thinking about time and where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know this life. I've been thinking about family, how it's going so fast. Well, I wake up one morning just wishing that I can go back this life. I've been thinking about lately, maybe I could make a change and it could change me. So with all of my heart, this is my prayer singing, oh Lord, keep me in the moment this life. Uh, and this goes on, because I don't want to miss what you have for me, singing, oh Lord, show me what matters, throw away what I'm chasing after, because I don't want to miss what you have for me, keep me in the moment, um, et cetera. And this kind of thing um, continues. All I got is one shot, one try, one go around in this beautiful life. See, this is also then again a theology of glory. It's pointed at this life, this life, this life. Keep me in the moment is the title. Nothing about what the Bible is actually saying is about this keeping you in this moment in this life. It's the long view um, toward heaven. Uh, here's another one. Matthew West, hello, my name is, and again, just pulling these in the order they came up. Uh, hello, my name is Regret. I'm pretty sure we have met every single day of your life, this life. I'm the whisper inside that won't let you forget. Hello, my name is Defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I'll drag you right back down again till you've lost all this life. These are the voices. These are the ties. And I believe them the very last time. Hello, my... Okay, and this goes on. I'm a child. Hello, my name is the child of the one true king. I've been saved. It mentions salvation. It you have to know that, but I've been saved, and he gets a point for that. I've been changed. I've been set free. Um, Amazing Grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is Child of One Through King. Now, it's not talked about sin yet or what you're saved from or saved for, but at least I'm no longer defined by the wreckage behind um, the one who makes all things new has proven it's true. Just take a look at my life. That's now... Um, all right, so at least it mentions being saved. That's still a theology of glory focused on this life. Uh, this, this is Jordan Philly's witness. I was blinded. You gave me eyes to see. I was going under. You reached out to me. No, there's nothing you won't do to pick me up and pull me through every hour, eight days a week. That's this life. Your love is like a fountain. It'll never run dry. It'll never run dry. Your love is moving mountains every day of my life, my life. Can I get a witness? Oh, ooh, oh, ooh, hallelujah. Oh, ooh, oh, ooh, hallelujah. All right, whatever. We want glory, but can't measure up. We try money, don't get enough. We fill our sky with fate of life, trying to guide us through the night, but you're the one thing that'll carry us. Okay, so this again, we were talking about this. Jesus is often depicted as a healer, miracle worker, someone to give blessings, but only in this life. Your love is like a fountain. It'll never run dry, never run dry. Your love's moving mountains. That's repeated all again. So much love, so much grace. Come on now, can I get a witness? Somebody in this place, come on now, can I get a witness? So much love. Okay, that's just repeated a bunch of times. Your love is like, okay, they do that all again. Okay, so there's actually no mention of Jesus in the entire song, no mention of the cross, no mention of sin, no mention of blood atonement, and everything is about this life. And again, I, I don't want to just kind of come and um, let me come back to you guys. I, I don't I don't want to be to give the impression I just want to kind of come and, and and rip on this stuff and hurt people's feelings. I don't. I do want to draw attention. That's my job, that's my call. Uh, I want to draw attention to theology when it's problematic. The theology of this stuff is the theology of glory and is exactly what this book is describing. A Christ who's a healer, a miracle worker, or uh, who gives us blessings in this life. 
Um, and a lot, I've looked at songs, obviously, a lot that was a part of the early ministry that, that I was doing until I, I discovered that it was really, really, really problematic and stopped. Um, this is a theology of glory. No cross, no blood. I'm not saying that never, ever, ever shows up in these songs because it does. Um, but with regard to, you know, we just pulled four songs. There's a fifth one I had, and it would have been the same thing because I've already looked at it. You, you, when you pull five songs in a row, and they're all five theology of glory, and you do this randomly, and you do it enough, and you keep seeing, keep seeing, keep seeing, keep seeing, you see what's what's going on here. Um, this is um, Jesus as my guru. Jesus as my therapist. Jesus as my boyfriend. Jesus gets me through this life. That's not why he came and died on the cross. Okay, it was about sin. Um, I want to go to the comments and take a look at the chat and deal with this first uh, before we move on. Um, here's a comment. I want to observe that this Christianity on natural knowledge terms and the various uh, bad theologies that come from it um, is the reason the doctrine of justification is so key. Everyone wants to know they're right with the powers that be, even if they misunderstand him, and I guess not only Christianity, but everyone. Um, yeah, so that's the, the theology of glory. Um, to connect to my, this is Jeremy, to connect to my previous comment on justification, I suspect the theology of glory stuff happens because they reckon material blessings represent God's favor. I'm doing good and happy in life. God loves me. Um, yeah, so the theology of glory happens uh, because, that's right, because we're not focused on our sin. We are focused on this life going well. And uh, we instrumentalize God and want to kind of manipulate God into fixing our relationships or fixing our job or fixing our whatever in this life. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a dollar store God versus the richness and abundance of who God really is because God doesn't exist to give us money and fix our relationships and um, hold our hand through our tears. I'm not saying he doesn't do those things, um, but those are all completely way down the line from the primary purpose, which God saves us from ourselves, from our sin for eternity. And, and the, the issue here with the, with, with the theology of glory, this overly simplistic view of God is, well, what do you do with pain? You know, we looked at five songs. Okay, which one of them deals with the reality of sin or the reality of death or the reality of any suffering beyond, you know, my, my personal sadness because I don't know my latte came and it didn't have whipped cream on it or whatever. You know, you see what I'm saying? It's a simplistic, um, superficial view of God that doesn't, doesn't deal with poverty, doesn't deal with, you know, how can there be 80, 90% of the world doesn't live like us and doesn't have what we have. And, and people die from not having, how do we have seven hours from here on the Navajo reservation, 30 to 40% of the Navajo have no running water, no electricity. How can that be? You know, th this, this simplistic approach that God's job is to fix my current life doesn't deal with the reality of suffering and, and doesn't address sin and, and needs to, um, because that's why, that's why God's um, here for us. That's who God um, really actually is. All right, let's move into uh, the revealed knowledge of God. I want to check the chat real quick before... Yeah, contrast all of this with the presentation we saw from Dr. Gottfried Martins a few weeks ago, being thankful and suffering. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a really good point. We watched the address from Dr. Gottfried Martins um, from a pastor in Germany who, who, who did exactly the opposite of the theology of glory. He had a wealthy church, a successful church, and an easy pastorate, and people who liked him, and they were chugging along. And all of a sudden, that uh, glorious world got wrecked because some um, broken, impoverished, hurting, suffering uh, immigrants had the nerve to come to their church. And uh, the, the, the cool kids didn't want to deal with that. 
and they told Dr. Uh, Markins that, look, you need to kind of send them away. They need to, we need to stop focusing so much time and energy on these immigrants. We have our own issues, blah, blah, blah. And he said to them, if I send them away, I will go with them. And they, they thought he was bluffing and they called his bluff and he left. <laughs> and he, he went and they found an old run down parish with 10 people left that was willing to take them all in. And he gave up his, his income and his benefits and his everything to be the pastor uh, to these uh, primarily Muslim immigrants from all over the world who are running away from war and disaster and so forth. And we're, we're coming somehow finding their way into Germany and we're being ministered to by Christians and we're converting. And he became their pastor. That church 10 years later is the second largest church in Germany. And he's very specific to say in his address, this was an address to the 2018, yeah, 20, 2018 um, LCMS National Convention. Russ and I were there um, in person. And this, is, uh, this video of his sermon is on, uh, available on YouTube. You can hunt him down, Dr. Gottfried Martin's address to the LCMS Convention 2018, I want to say Tampa. Um, and he was very careful to say it actually was a theology of glory in his previous parish. Things are going well. Don't let these immigrants mess that up. We've got money. We've got this. We've got that. Um, it's a very strong pull on the flesh to worry about this life. God's supposed to fix my problems here. He's supposed to hold my hand through the tough times. He's supposed to, supposed to, supposed to, right? The very, very human desire uh, to put God in a box and make him be my fix-it man for this life. And, and Dr. Martin's left. And it was in the suffering of the immigrants um, that, that ministry broke out, you know, that, that if God is a God who's our therapist and hand holder, then where is God in the suffering lives of immigrants who watch their wives and children back home given away to Muslim radicals as punishment for the dad um, converting to Christianity. You know, he got out in his, his job. He's making a way to bring his family with him. And before he can bring his family with him, they're given away to another man, to Muslim radicals as punishment. You know, well, where's the pop song about that, right? Um, or where's the theology of glory in that? It's not there because the theology of glory looks for God to, to fix my boo-boos in this life. And that's not what, what God is about. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point about Dr. Martin's. Um, tell you what, it's 914. Let's not start the revealed knowledge of God because then we'll just get a hair into it and have to stop. Let's save that as a, as a fresh new unit um, for next time. Uh, and again, I want to make, uh, make the point that um, I don't want to give the impression that you can't listen um, to, to pop Christian music. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, I don't want to make the point that it's somehow evil or bad. No, I'm not saying that either. Um, I think that given that pretty much everything else is, is lyric-wise, lyrics-wise, is trash, right? Um, if, if that's a style of music you like, and remember, it is a, it's a genre. It's a particular style. It's not for everybody, even the style of music. Um, it's what your grandparents were slow dancing to at prom 40 years ago, and if you like that, that's great. Somebody had to save that genre, right? Um, that's fine. The, you could do way worse, right? You could do way, because it's really hard to listen to anything and have clean lyrics. So you could do way worse, right? So, the, so I'm not saying any of that. I am saying watch out, no matter what you're listening to, have your theological ears tuned in. Watch out for that theology of glory, the reason why is that we're like we're sponges, or the old Chinese proverb is we're like fish. We become like the water we swim in. What you're watching and what you're listening to, you are taking in. In the same way that you eat healthy, that your body may be healthy, you should visually and audially con uh, consume healthy for your emotions, psyche, and spirit. Um, in the same way that we're very concerned about the environment and breathing clean air, you should be watching clean. You should be listening clean. You should not be polluting yourself with things that are not God-pleasing. 
And just because a song's lyrics are clean or just because we can torque or twist them into a Christian meaning doesn't mean that they're actually healthy for us. Um, they could still be clean and still be theological cotton candy. And everybody knows that while cotton candy is good once in a while, you try to live on that three meals a day and you're going to have problems. And that, that's my point. That's what I'm trying to say. So take it in doses, everything in moderation. Uh, and I hope that was clear. If you have any questions about any of that, definitely contact me, text, email, you know, let me know. Uh, and I would love to help you out uh, more with that as much as, uh, as I'm able. Let's close here so we can get ready for church, give people time to transition over to YouTube, to our YouTube channel for the live stream. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you that you teach us in all truth through your word, that your Holy Spirit gives us wisdom working through that means of grace, the word to change and form us into the children that we should be. Give us wisdom and understanding so that we may keep ourselves clean, uh, not just in the popular things like our diet and the environment, but uh, even in the unpopular things by giving us um, and leading us in self-discipline with regard to media. What are we watching? What are we hearing? Is it clean? Is it godly? Uh, grant that we would constantly be asking ourselves these questions and grant that we would be strong enough by your spirit to put things aside, to turn them off and put them away when they're not God-pleasing. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. Have a great day in the Lord. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.